Spartan Lecture Series that we do throughout the semester. Excited to have all of you uh, here this morning. We're going to hear from our speaker again. I'll introduce him uh, in just a moment. But as we get started today, uh, one of the ministry teams that we have on campus is called In Character. They do drama ministry and a variety of uh, service things uh, in our community. And so they're going to uh, do a skit for us this morning as we get started. So let's welcome them to the stage. satisfied. Well, what did I do? You interrupted a perfectly good thought I was having. I'm sorry? Well, you should be. But then that's why you're here, isn't it? It is? Listen, this is the Office of Guilt Administration. If you weren't feeling guilty about something, I'd sure hope you'd have enough good sense to go bother someone else. Right. Sorry. I think we've already established that. Can we move on here? Oh, yeah. Well, you see, I went to another window, but they told me I should come here. Who is they? Them over at the Office of Paybacks. Oh, good people. Go on. Well, you see, they told me that you might be able to help me with my problem. Well, from the looks of things, I doubt it. But go on. Tell me your problem, and we'll see what we can do. Well, <laughs> you see, I'm not quite sure how to say it. Oh, please. I can hardly stand the suspense. I'm really sorry. Look, the Department of Redundancy Department is two doors down. Oh, well, fine. I can't take it anymore, so I've come here to get it all straightened out. You see, I'm here because I don't feel like I'm living up to everyone's expectations of me. Finally! Now we're getting somewhere. What form do you need? Neglectful motherhood, form GA-171. Neglectful wife, form GA-176. Kitchen deficiencies, form GA-299. You mean there's a form for all of those things? Listen, this is the Office of Guilt Administration. Here's how that works. You come to us, you fill out a form for every area of your life that you think you failed in, and in just four to six weeks, we give you a complete evaluation of just how lousy a person you are and how badly you should feel about it. I think I'm feeling worse already. We aim to please. Which form do you want, or shall it be one of each? Um, well, I don't see the one that I really need. Oh, well, which one is that? The one for being a lousy Christian. Uh-oh. What do you mean, uh-oh? We get a lot of Christians in here. You guys don't need a guilt administrator. Why not? Y'all have that grace thing going for you. Well, you see, I know all about that. But the thing is, I'm not a very good Christian. Yeah, why do you say that? Well, everyone knows that in order to be a good Christian, God expects certain things from you. And I try, but I just can't seem to get it all together. I mean, there must be a million rules I've broken. Oh, like the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule and those ones? <laughs> Make that a million and eleven. Look, I'm really not supposed to tell you this. I mean, this could cost me my job and everything, but you've got it all wrong. I don't think so. It's pretty simple. See, I really want to please God, but there's just no way he can be pleased with me these days. Just find me the right form, and I'll fill it out, and you'll see. You don't need a form. All you need is this. But, wait a minute. That's exactly what brought me here in the first place. It says that having a relationship with Jesus, plus keeping all of his rules, is the way to truly please God. And believe me, I'm really lousy at it. Uh, the way I read it. Having a relationship with Jesus plus nothing is the way to truly please God. And I bet you're better at nothing than you think you are. But aren't I supposed to feel guilty about all the things I mess up? Look, I'm a guilt administrator. I don't think I'm the right person to talk to about that kind of thing. But, <sighs> but well, then what am I supposed to do now? Look, you take this and you go exploring and you see what you find. I have work to do. Next! Thank you, in character. Again, it's a joy to be with you this morning. I want to introduce our speaker today. If you were not here yesterday, uh, Jason Thacker serves as Chair of Research and Technology Ethics at the ERLC, that's the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, which is part of the Southern Baptist Convention. If you're not familiar with that organization, 
the ERLC is a way in which uh, Southern Baptist churches partner together and have an organization that advocates for them uh, in the political realm. And so they're doing uh, research, uh, seeing what's going on in Washington so we can advocate for religious liberty uh, amongst many other things. Uh, Jason, while serving there, also writes and speaks on various topics related to human dignity, public theology, technology, uh, artificial intelligence. He's written a number of books, including The Age of AI, Artificial Intelligence, and the Future of Humanity. And he's a graduate of the University of Tennessee and the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, where he's working on finishing his uh, PhD. Uh, I hope that you will give him a warm MBU welcome this morning. Well, good morning. It is good to see you all again this morning. Um, as Dr. Lumpkin said, my name is Jason Thacker. Uh, the most important thing about me is actually my family. Uh, I have a wife named Dory. We will spend nine years together as of, at the end of this month. So we're having our ninth anniversary. And we have two little boys, a six-year-old and a five-year-old named Hollis and Porter. Um, and it is fun because as I talk a lot about artificial intelligence, I often think about my children. I think about them because, not because they're artificially intelligent, that's kind of a bad joke, um, but because this is the world in which they're growing up. And there are some unique challenges that they'll face um, as kids. But as we get going this morning, I always like to joke, especially when I talk about artificial intelligence or chat GPT, that no, this talk was not written by the chatbot. Uh, this is something that I actually wrote, um, but it is kind of fascinating and interesting. We'll talk a little bit about the, the technology itself, some of the potential benefits, but also a lot of the drawbacks. And specifically this morning, how Christians can think about some of these uh, pressing challenges of these emerging technologies from a place of faith, specifically rooted in the scripture, and how God would call us to live in light of what he's already done. I think for most of us, when we think about artificial intelligence, we typically have one of two reactions. We typically, some of us are very excited. We're kind of almost this kind of utopian vision. We see all the potential benefits and there's a lot of excitement and intrigue about where we're heading and what's gonna, be, what's gonna happen and how this may revolutionize and change all of our society. There's a lot of excitement. On the other side of us, there's m many of us who are very fearful. We're kind of scared a little bit. Maybe we're wondering like, what is this gonna mean for my job? What is this gonna mean for my organization? What is this gonna mean for my church or my family? What is it going to look like if we truly do automate so many jobs and we have massive job loss and we have all of these fears that are kind of conjured up? Kind of what we talked about yesterday briefly, I do think that these two reactions are often tied to how we think about technology. What is technology? Is it just a tool that we use for good or for evil? Or is it actually something that is deeply forming and shaping us? And while this morning we won't unpack that specifically, I want to do talk about this kind of fear and as, as well as this kind of hope of the future. On one hand, the fear of the future makes sense as we look out at the rise of artificial intelligence specifically and how it's being used to automate so many different areas of our life. From our personal lives, to our families, to our educational experiences, to our churches, to the workplace, and even to the public square. On the other hand, we see a lot of the concerns that seem to kind of seem outrageous. They seem a little bit over the top. And a lot of the alarms can kind of fall on deaf ears. We talk about, oh, well, you're just scared of the future. You really just need to embrace these technologies and move forward. Because we're talking about all the promised benefits. And look, look at all the advances in technology and where we are as a society. And I think there's truth to both of these positions in many ways. This latter position of this kind of fear, or in, excuse me, this kind of benefits and all this excitement around is often kind of summed up in the old Silicon Valley mantra of move fast and break things. What they mean by that is this wait and see, or is this really a problem? Let's keep pushing headlong into innovation because there's so many benefits that are going to come. And we'll deal with kind of the messy stuff later on. Often the dangers are downplayed and possible future benefits are placed front and center because that's really what our goal is. Well, this morning, I'm not going to take time to kind of unpack some of these fundamental attitudes and the feelings towards artificial intelligence specifically. I do think it's wise for us as Christians, as we think about these technologies, to go to a place of, of wisdom. That's what, a little bit of what we talked about yesterday, of realizing that there are real benefits, but there are also some real drawbacks. But technology is also not a neutral tool. It's not something that we just choose to use, but in many ways, it's using us. It's forming and shaping our perspective of God shaping our perspective of ourselves, which is especially prevalent 
in the conversations about artificial intelligence, as well as shaping our perspective of the world around us, including our neighbors who are created in the very image of God, just like me and you. So one of the things that I often like to do when I talk about artificial intelligence, let's define what we're talking about. Because for some of us, when I say AI, your mind goes to like sci-fi movies and these like crazy thrillers and how the robots are going to take over the world. And for some of us, we think of our smartphones. Reality is, is even if we try, and we've tried for so many years to kind of keep AI at arm's length, acting like we're not really utilizing it every single day, the reality is, is that we are. We're surrounded by artificial intelligence. I'm even cautious to say, hey, Google, or OK Siri, or help, you know, hey, Siri, or whatever, because somebody's device might light up, including my own. Thankfully, I have it on Do Not Disturb, so it won't pop up and say, what do you need? We are surrounded by these things, and not just in terms of smart assistants, in terms of our email systems, in terms of social media and the, quote, algorithms that are shaping and controlling many of the things you see. From your Netflix queue to your Amazon shopping cart, the recommendation algorithms or what you might like, or even often even our advertising that we see is personalized and curated just for us. You are utilizing artificial intelligence every single day whether you realize it or not. Simply put, artificial intelligence is what is defined as non-biological intelligence. And you're like, okay, that's not a helpful definition, but let's break it down a little bit. It's essentially where a machine can perform, a computer system can perform what tasks were once reserved for human beings. And this kind of ranges from processing vast amounts of information, making various decisions on these data and input, inputs, or even simulating certain human-like behaviors like communication, decision-making, and even some levels of creativity now, where we're seeing in writing and art and even audio and film, especially with the rise of what's called generative AI. Now, that's a sub-discipline of a broader category of artificial intelligence, but AI really represents kind of a broad swath of computer science, from issues like machine learning and deep learning to natural language processing. Essentially, what that means is the ability of dictation, where you can say, hey, dictate this, or hey, Siri, do X, and it starts to do all of those things and type it out. Issues of robotics and machine learning, machine vision, speech recognition, and so much more. I always laugh that when you go online, often you're trying to log into something, it's like, let's make sure you're not a robot. You know, you have that little thing and you have all those things you're supposed to click on the images and where's the sidewalk type of thing. I don't know what it says about me, but I often fail those things. So I don't know if that actually means that I'm a robot or not. But it is interesting the way, the reason that happens is because we have advanced forms of artificial intelligence and computer systems that can mimic or imitate human behavior where it's hard to distinguish the idea between a bot and a real human being. So as we start to cut through and kind of navigate some of these questions, naturally comes up of, well, are there various forms of artificial intelligence? Yes, there are lots of different algorithms and different forms and ways that AI takes shape in our society, but often this is categorized, as many describe it, in terms of three different types of artificial intelligence. And I don't want to get too deep on the weeds here, but I want to introduce you to this to show you kind of where people think we may be headed. Right now, every single form of AI that you've ever seen or used or even heard about is what's called narrow AI. Narrow AI is essentially the ability of a machine to make those complex decisions in a very narrow environment, meaning my thermostat, my Nest thermostat, can only change the temperature. Your Siri can maybe not do a lot of things, but Siri can uh, call somebody or give me a map or text somebody for me. But Siri can't be opening, you know, in reality, is not opening my garage door or doing other things. We have very narrow applications. So there's a lot of different types of algorithms, a lot of different forms of artificial intelligence, but it's in a very narrow application. Now, there are a lot of sci-fi dreams, a lot of philosophical dreams even, of where we might be heading in terms of general or broad AI. Now, what that means, and specifically the only type of general intelligence that the universe has ever known, is me and you. It's human-level intelligence. This is a, a vain dream, I think, and I think there's some good theological and philosophical reasons to think this, uh, but not everyone may agree with me. There's actually widespread debate with even in the computer science and AI community if we'll ever reach human level intelligence. So you have narrow AI, you have broad or general AI, and then kind of what comes after that? 
It's a God-like intelligence, a super intelligence, something like a God that is all-encompassing, that transcends human intelligence, that kind of overwhelms and overwhelms us as we start to think about where we may be headed in the future. One of the fun things about these conversations, if you read anything about the literature about broad or general AI and super intelligence, most often than not, it's always, they'll predict of when it's coming. It's typically 25, 30, or more years away. Always. It's been that way since the 1950s, actually. It's been that way since the 1980s and the 2000s. Well, one of the reasons, think about that why. I once read, and I can't remember where it was, someday I'll find it. Uh, an author was talking about the reason that is is because that's just far, just close enough that it feels real but far enough away that no one will remember when I'm wrong. We have had long dreams and so often when we talk about artificial intelligence we think that AI is just kind of a new invention. It's just something we've just come up with in the last decade or two. Reality is, is that artificial intelligence in some form or fashion has been around since the 1950s actually. The term was coined by um, a gentleman named John McCarthy in the 1950s at a summer meeting at Dartmouth College of a number of computer scientists that came together to say, this is what we think AI can do. They actually wrote out a number of principles on the board. Kind of funny enough, and kind of a lot of times the hype cycle around AI that we all know, they thought they would accomplish all of those goals probably that year. Most of those goals we have yet to obtain. Often we've been limited um, in terms of computer power. We've been limited in terms of technology of where we're headed. We have big dreams, but we don't have the ability to perform them or to go about those type of tasks. We've had throughout the history of AI from the 1950s even to now, we've had heights of AI hype. I think we're in one right now, by the way. Most of you are probably thinking, oh, chat GPT and all that cool stuff. Yeah, we're kind of at a, a hype cycle meaning it's really high, everyone's talking about it, there's a lot of intrigue and investment going on. Interestingly enough, there's also typically these dips in what they call AI winters, where nothing really takes place. People think it's kind of it's a lost art, there's really no reason to invest in these things. And part of that is because uh, we have been limited by access to data, access to computer systems, or even power, to be able to power these type of systems to be able to make those type of decisions. But all of that to say is that narrow AI is the only form of artificial intelligence that you can see, that you can experience, that you can actually use. And there's good reason to think it may be the only type of AI that we can actually create. These narrow systems undergird so much of our modern life. I've already talked about from our Netflix and Amazon algorithms to smart devices, anything that's called a smartphone, a smart device, a smart appliance, a smart coffee maker. It has a form of artificial intelligence, either semi-advanced or even kind of rudimentary. Reality is, is that we're utilizing this stuff every single day, and it always reminds me of this quote from the famed computer scientist and futurist named Ray Kurzweil that some of us may be familiar with. Ray Kurzweil says, he says, if all of our AI systems decided to go on strike tomorrow, essentially this is kind of waking up, gaining consciousness, and deciding they don't want to work anymore, so it's kind of a vain dream in some sense, he said, our civilization would be crippled we could not get money from our bank. Indeed, our money would disappear. Communication, transportation, and manufacturing would all grind to a halt. Lest you think that you're not utilizing artificial intelligence, I promise that you are, and it's actually undergirding so much of our society. We are, the bottom line here is that we are all utilizing AI technologies each and every single day, whether we're aware of it or not. So what's happened, what's going on right now that everyone seems kind of fixated and they're talking about artificial intelligence? Well, ChatGPT was released. It's actually changing and I think and fundamentally in some very interesting ways challenging what we actually think it means to be human. But if we take a step back and what we've been encouraging throughout this week about the nature of technology and the way we as Christians approach it, if we step back and slow down and ask some of the big questions, I think that it can frame up because remember, technology is not a neutral tool. It's something that's deeply shaping you and forming you as you engage with these technologies. It's changing your perception of God, especially changing your perception of yourself and what does it mean to be uniquely human as well as what does it mean to love our neighbor as ourself and engage in the world that God has created. Technology is in many ways expanding what we think is possible. It's not changing what we hope 
it doesn't change a lot of our vices and sins and aspirations, but what it is changing is the scale at which we can do things, the ability of which we can do things. And again, one of the reasons that I, when I talk about AI, I don't want to just kind of narrow cast it into, oh, just chat GPT, is because AI is undergirding so much of our society. So what I try to do in my work and throughout my writing and even this morning is framing these issues in light of larger issues. AI and specifically technology issues are not a separate subset of issues in the Christian life. It's because AI is, and technology is undergirding so many elements of our life in terms of human dignity issues, in terms of sexuality and marriage issues, in terms of pro-life issues, in terms of religious freedom issues, and especially international issues. But as most of us know by now, ChatGPT kind of entered the scene. It's kind of shaken uh, the, the ways that we think about these things, and it's actually, there's much hype going on. It seems like every single day there's another article that's come out about something else it can do or something that it can't do, and many of us are kind of becoming aware of this system. This system was actually launched by a company called OpenAI on November 30th of last year, of, of 2022. OpenAI is a San Francisco-based AI startup that was founded in 2015 by a group of technologists, including many like Elon Musk and Peter Thiel. Chat GPT, a lot of us don't understand what the GPT stands for. It's an acronym, and it literally stands for Chat Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Now, I think most of us, you're like, cool, dude, that was right over my head. Like, I have no idea what that means. I want to pick up on one little piece there, generative, the G, and what that means. These systems have been fine-tuned to produce human-like prose and detailed information through the use of supervised and unsupervised learning. Supervised meaning there's a human element. Often we think that these systems just kind of run on their own and they just kind of do it. There's a human, often a team of humans behind the scenes that are programming and shaping um, even the data and kind of uh, cleaning the data up that it has. And then the system is learning and through reinforcement techniques, it actually is growing and learning and becoming better and more accurate each and every day. Right now we have ChatGPT3. They're already working on ChatGPT4. So you can see kind of the, the way that technology is just a constant cycle of innovation. This system is what's called a predictive text model. Essentially what it is is that it's calculating based on very fancy math that I don't understand. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm an ethicist. It's calculating certain outcomes, and so it becomes very predictable. It's calculating the first word and then the, the uh, predictability of the second and then the third and the fourth and the fifth, and it comes up with some really amazing like things. The service was initially launched as free, so many of you may actually have accounts actually with the system. By December 4th, so it launched on January 30th, by December 4th, ChatGPT already had 1 million users. That's in about six days, five days, okay? Stick with me here. By January, ChatGPT had reached 100 million users, meaning it is the fastest growing consumer, consumer application in the history of humanity. Faster than any social media platform, faster than any service that you've used. So you can see why we're all talking about it. Some of you may go right now and actually get on your phone and go sign up for it. Interestingly enough, it's said such interest that it's actually much slower. Uh, you can't actually access it. They're kind of having to wean people off of it. And one of the things that they're doing is actually launching a, a paid or premium service where you're going to start paying for it. So you can have a a free model, and you can also have a $20 a month version or a professional version that's only $42 a month. Remember, nothing is free, folks. Whether it's free in the terms of you get access to it for free, it's gathering data from you that it is using to produce these systems and to fine-tune them, or you end up paying for them. So you're going to pay for them with money, or you're going to pay for them with your data. It's really interesting to note with artificial intelligence, uh, specifically with ChatGPT, because it's interesting about the type of ethical questions it's raising, not just in terms of the way we use it, but often the way that we talk about ourselves in terms of these systems. So why the alarm? Why is everyone panicking or incredibly excited, but kind of those two fears that we talked about are two uh, different reactions. Why is everyone kind of excited about this system? Well. I think it's because artificial intelligence more broadly, but specifically ChatGPT, this generative AI, is challenging what we think it means to be human. So much of the history of the church and really the history of mankind, we have defined what it meant to be human based on the things we do. 
based on having high level of creativity or high level of cognitive ability to be able to think, to be able to process, to be truly intelligent. And there's a lot of questions about what we mean by intelligence and all of that, but it's interesting to note that these systems are doing things that seemed just once reserved for humans. My dog could be really smart, but my dog isn't producing this voluminous amount of text. It's something fundamentally different about this tool that we're using that is mimicking and imitating what it means to be human. From a Christian perspective, we often talk about this in terms of the image of God. So when I say, what does it mean to be human? You say, well, it means to be an image bearer. You know, Genesis 126 to 28. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. We'll make male and female. He created them in his very image. The image of God is a theme that runs throughout the scriptures. And it's something that talks about our, our, our dignity, our value, and our worth as human beings. What makes us unique among the rest of creation. Interestingly enough, that image has often been defined. There's actually a lot of debate over what actually is the image of God. But often we've talked about this in terms of our cognitive ability, our rational capabilities, our intelligence, and for good reason. But I think one of the things we're noticing with artificial intelligence is it's kind of upending that paradigm a little bit. It's shocking us. It's scaring us a little bit because I thought what it meant to be human was that I, had, I could be smart. I could write, I could be creative. Why is it that this machine can do things like that and sometimes better than I can? Have you seen some of the AI art that's come out? It's kind of spectacular. When you see these things, it's amazing some of the things you've been able to see. So I think that's actually one of the reasons that we see a little bit of this alarm right now is because how we have historically understood what it meant to be human and you have these machines that are doing things that seemed once just reserved for humans and it scares us a little bit. But the Christian tradition has long acknowledged that it doesn't matter. It's not about what you do that makes you valuable. It's about who you are. That you are a human being. That you are an image bearer of the almighty God. So it's not about your output. It's not about what you do in society. It's about who you are as an image bearer of God. Now we don't have time to unpack theological anthropology or what it means to be uh, human in light of the scriptures in terms of theology, but I do think it's interesting that the Christian tradition says that whether you're an older person, whether um, you have declining cognitive abilities or whatever, or a preborn baby in the womb, that you are a human being, that status, that inalterable status is not about what you do, but about who you are. So when we face a lot of the challenges of these modern AI systems and they start to shape how we understand what it means to be human, we need to step back and realize that it's not about what we do, it's about who we are. Our value and our worth as human beings isn't dictated by what our outputs. It's based on what God says about us, that unalterable and unchanging status, that ontological or fundamental status of what it means to be human. And I think that when we take that approach of human dignity, it can actually help to shape a proper Christian ethical response to a lot of the challenges we're facing. As with most technologies, generative AI systems have a host of benefits as well as some potential downfalls. Because remember, technology is not just a tool. It's all, not all the good and it's not all the bad. And so we don't, as Christians, have to panic. We don't have to freak out. We have hope. We have a steadfast hope. We also have a robust sense of calling about how God has called us to live no matter the circumstances, no matter the challenges. And it's summed up in Jesus' own words. Remember what Matthew 22 says when Jesus is being pressed by the Pharisees and the Sadducees that are testing him? He's asked by a lawyer to say, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the first and second greatest commandment. This idea of framing up the idea of approaching artificial intelligence and emerging technologies through this idea of human dignity, of what it means to be human, and this framework of loving God and loving our neighbor, I think can help us to navigate a lot of the challenges before us. As I said, ChatGPT has a lot of interesting things. It's relatively novel in many ways, but in reality, it's, long, it's actually showing what has long been possible with artificial intelligence, but it's going mainstream. We see it summarizing complex ideas, writing copy, responding to others, aiding us in really, at times, very complex tasks. Just as this over this weekend, I was preaching at a church and I had taken my sermon text, and let me be very honest with you, in fourth right, I'm an ethicist, I have to be. I had already written my sermon. But I did take my text and the theme and pop it into JetGPT and see what did it do? And it came up with a decent sermon outline. 
pretty, pretty decent. I could actually see someone preaching that. That's not how I would approach the text, but I could see someone preaching that. Did it again, and it was utter garbage. It's unpredictable and exactly where it's going to land. So there are a lot of benefits to this. It can help to augment our work, and it can maybe even take our ideas and, create, and kind of help us to focus on what it uniquely means to be human in terms of the content and the learning and how we think about these tools. But there's also, we could be disappointed with the results, kind of like I was on that second time of putting it in the system, asking the exact same question, and it gave me a completely different answer. It's very predictable. There was nothing about that that was, quote, novel. There was nothing about that that was maybe even, quote, challenging, per se. It was just a very basic broilerplate thing. So go back to the P in chat GPT. P is predictable. It's baked right into the name, folks. When you look at the na- what it is, it's that it's limited often by its data sets. It's limited by its human supervision. So much so that it often, and has been widely known, and I'll just say this for students' sake, to falsify information, to make up ideas, to falsely attribute quotes to people who never said them, to have factual errors, and to also allow political and social views to creep into its answers. Interestingly enough, it's become very politically correct since it was launched. Why? Because people were asking it very tough questions, divisive questions in our society, and the creators wanted to answer in a particular way. Nothing is neutral, not even ChatGPT. So these systems rarely known, as we've already talked about, they falsify information, misapply concepts, but they also rarely account for complexity and nuance. It's very interesting to see not only of what is much that it produces is broilerplate and basic and predictable, but as you... If you think about it, is if you go back and you actually know a subject really well and you ask it a question, you come back and go, huh, that's fine. It's kind of missing it here, here, and here, and it could use this and X, Y, and Z. But for those who may not be, have high levels of training or at least experience, we can become overly reliant upon these tools, thinking that we can, they'll pass the muster, they'll get us the grade, they'll help us to turn that paper in on time, etc. But as Christians, how do we think about these type of technologies? How do we think about the way that we should frame them up in light of the Christian ethic and how we're called to live? I want to say, give us a couple practical ways as we kind of wrap up our time this morning um, to think about the way that technology like this is shaping and forming us and what we can do in response. One of the things that we haven't had a lot of time to talk about this week, but I've written a good bit about, is the uh, relationship of how technology is shaping our perspective of truth, our understanding of truth itself. Interestingly enough, not only has misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories, and fake news uh, gone mainstream, meaning that anybody with access to a phone can say these things without any recourse or real any, even in accountability. It's not that these things are new, it's that they can go at scale. You know, one of the ways that a lot of people are worried about chat GPT and the way it can be used, right now we're limited not in terms of the distribution scale, but the creative scale. ChatGPT can be used to create fake news, misinformation, and disinformation at scale and to spread it at scale via social media. So many are concerned about the way that we already have a very interesting relationship with, quote, truth in our society. Many have led us to call what we now know as post-truth society, that we live in a post-truth society where truth no longer matters. It's actually something that my truth is really what I want. It's my desires. It's how I feel rather than something external to us. Interestingly enough, with ChatGPT, we're entering into a season where these systems not only can share it at scale, but also produce it at scale. So there's some really interesting questions about what this is going to do in the public square. So what do we do about it? So I want to give you three quick points about some guardrails. I can't imagine, I can't even stand up here or even pretend to answer every single question to give you a kind of buttoned up, perfect little answer about how we're gonna navigate all of the challenges before us. Some of the challenges we don't even know are heading. Some of them we do and they're just complex, they're nuanced. But first, I think the one thing that we need to do is make sure that we keep the idea of human dignity center in this conversation. Center in our approach to technology and specifically with artificial intelligence. It's so easy for us to become enamored with these tools and just to simply assume because we can do something that we should. That is the fundamental question of ethics. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. The should is what it means to have wisdom, to think, thought, to think about these tools and to be thoughtful about our approach to them. Because we can do a lot of things, 
but it doesn't mean I should, not even that I'm designed to do those things or it would be good for me or for others to do that. So keeping this idea of human dignity centered helps us to think about when we approach these tools to slow down, like we talked about yesterday, to cultivate wisdom and to be thoughtful about the ways these tools will and can be used and abused. We're sinners, folks, every one of us. We are in rebellion against God, but God and his grace has saved us, but we are still struggling with sin at times. I am a sinner, you're a sinner. We will use these systems to exploit weaknesses, to take advantage of our neighbors, to, an interesting kind of note, we often in AI humanize our machines, we give them faces and names and treat them like humans. At the same time, we actually dehumanize ourselves. We see ourselves as nothing but a grouping of matter or something that's uh, gonna you know, pass away one day and there's no kind of external existence. We have a very low view of human and we have a rising view of these machines. We, hum- we dehumanize ourselves as we seek to humanize these machines. So stepping back and asking that question of wisdom of should I do something rather than just can I, I think can actually help to frame up these conversations surrounding that concept of human dignity. Second, we need to set realistic expectations. Often when I talk about these things, I'm talking to your professors or I'm talking to academics or I'm talking to researchers, but I wanna to talk to you as students. I know, I am a college professor, I know how many things you have on your plate. I know that you have jobs and that you have different responsibilities, you have sports, you have essays, you have tests, you have relationships, you have church, you have a host of things going on. We in our society live at this kind of frenetic, non pace like super speed uh, type of life. We're always going, 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 going. We're going from one thing to another, to another, to another, and often we overcommit ourselves. Often we're full of anxiety and stress and overwhelmed, and we're fatigued, and we don't know what to do. When I talk about these type of systems, and specifically what this means for students, I wanna say, I see you, I hear you, I understand why you may even be tempted to utilize these type of machines and these type of systems. But I'll give you some pointers. First and foremost, and this is a a full stop kind of thing, there's no equivocation on it. Passing off someone's ideas or something in the terms of AI, there's a real big distinction here, by the way, folks, in terms of human dignity. You are someone, it is something, it's an object. You are a person. Passing off someone's ideas or something in the case of AI is deceptive if you pass it off as your own ideas. It will violate, I would assume, the MBU MBU, uh, academic honesty policy and the plagiarism policy at this university. That isn't set to, uh, that isn't designed just to kind of keep you down or to make you do this kind of rote memorization type thing. The goal of these policies is to make sure that not only that you live a life of integrity, but that you actually seek what learning is. Learning isn't about information transfer and just memorizing a whole bunch of things. It's a process of development, of transformation, of learning, growing in your faith faith and maturing. Passing off someone or something's ideas as your own is is dishonest, it's deceptive, and it is a sin. It's something we should not do. But how also do we think about these things? I'll say it does, these systems can rob you of the privilege of learning. One of the blessings of a place like this is that we can come together in person and learn together to grow and to mature in our faith not just to get a grade. Often we've seen education, and especially in the West, as a means to an end. You turn in an assignment so that you can get a good grade, and the higher points, the better grade. The better grade you get on that assignment, the, more, the better grade you get at the end of the semester, the great, you get that grade, you get a diploma, you get a diploma, you get a job, you get a family, you get money, and somehow you'll be happy. I'm just gonna go on and tell you, that's not the way it works. Some of the richest and most wealthy and most established people are some of the most unhappy people in our society. Education is not about just this idea of intellectual or kind of intellectual growth per se or this just idea of information transfer. It's about transformation, about becoming a certain type of person, which by the way, you're created according to the image of God. Who is the image of God? Jesus. The whole process of the Christian life is to become more like Jesus. It's all about living life under his reign and rule and becoming like Jesus in every single aspect of our life. I'll tell you in just full stop to say that education has and always will be more about just getting a paycheck or getting a job or running this rat race of life. Don't let these type of systems rob you of that joy, rob you of those opportunities. 
The other is that you also have to recognize the limitations of these systems, not only in terms of data and in terms of uh, political and social biases and things like that, but one of the ways that these systems are limited is the type of output that they can give. One professor notes as I was doing some research to say, you need to assume, he tells his students this, you need to assume every single thing that that system says is wrong until you can prove it otherwise. Because why? It can falsify concepts, make up ideas, make up quotes, make up people. It often has a lot of factual errors. Your professors know about this, by the way. So when they read your essay and they go, huh, this sounds interesting, or that, I don't remember that quote from that person. They'll look at it and they'll go, huh, maybe someone in the beat was tempted to use this type of system. It can make up facts, dates, figures, articles, and even ideas. And, and it will get better each day, but you simply cannot have this kind of inherent trust in these systems to do the right thing. It rarely, as we've already said, picks up on complex or nuanced ideas. And so that's one of the things that I want you to say is not only having a good and open relationship with one another, but also with your professors. To be honest about where you are in your life and the struggles that you're having or the things going on because they care about more, more about you as a person than just a number. It's about a person than just a grade. So having that open and honest dialogue I think can go a long way of helping to frame up these conversations in light of Christian wisdom. This list is not exhaustive. I don't even stand up to here and act like I'm somehow addressing every single issue, but I hope that a talk like this helps to spark conversation among the campus community, among the faculty and staff, among you as students, to start to have these type of conversations, to be open and honest about them, to talk about these technologies and how they're shaping our life. Christians don't have to be fearful. We don't have to be fearful in the midst of all of these things because we can be reminded that we have a steadfast hope and a robust ethic. The scripture is more than sufficient to navigate the big pressing challenges of our day if we will lean into this in a place of wisdom, hope, and faith rather than this debilitating pessimism that many of us fall into or this kind of unbridled optimism. In the age of AI, the Christian ethic is calling us to a particular way of living outside of ourselves to focus on loving God and to loving our neighbors ourselves. It reminds us that, uh, the Christian ethic reminds us that truth is not in the eye of the beholder and that technology is more than just a tool that we use but is actually something that's deeply shaping and forming us. AI is fundamentally challenging and changing our society. I think we can say that without equivocation. One of the ways it's doing that is challenging what we fundamentally think it means to be human. The best part of the, the gospel and the, the biblical story is that the scripture gives us a clear understanding of who we are as created in God's very image and how he has a deep and abiding love for all of us and a good calling and a passion in life. We have this steadfast hope, even in the midst of what feels at times to be an uncertain future, because God is sovereign. God is good, God cares about us, and nothing, not even the most advanced artificial intelligence machine will actually be able to change what it means to be human because you were uniquely made by the creator of the universe. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for a place like this that we can gather together, God, that we can learn and be challenged and to think deeply about the pressing challenges before us. God, I pray that you'd be with each of these students. God, that you'd be with them through their studies, even this week. God, I know there are thousands of things on their minds. There's pressures and anxieties and stresses and many of them feel even overwhelmed now. God, would you be their peace? God, would you be their comfort? God, would you be with them in the midst of this and keep them from temptations to use these machines or these tools in unethical ways and ungodly ways, um, but to have an open and honest dialogue with the campus community, their faculty, their staff, the administration, so that we might honor you in everything we do. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he's done in our lives and how you've made us in your very image. And we pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen.